What's up, everybody? It's the Alex Leak and Friends NFL Podcast, back for another week. I'm your host, Alex Leak. We got Dustin on the show, as always. Good to have you, Dustin. Hey, thanks for having me. Another week. Absolutely. This is the Week 10 Recap. You talk about the season flying by. We're already in double digits. Yeah, that's that's crazy, man. Starting to get, we're talking about a big snow game coming up in uh, Buffalo. Starting to get to my favorite time of year, November, December, all these games. A lot more of these games become must wins, you know? Yeah, absolutely, man. How fun would that be? I know it'd be cold, but if you were bundled up, how fun would that be to be there? Oh, man, I would be there in a heartbeat. I love it. Like, yeah, I mean, people talk about it being cold. Look, bundle up, you know, have lighters on, be ready to go, have multiple beers in your system, take some edibles, do what you got to do, and have some fun in the snow. You know what I mean? Absolutely. So let's get into this. I mean, week 10 recap and a hell of a week of football. A lot of uh, action and some unexpected stuff going on as well. How about Thursday night, the 4-5 and five Falcons at the 2-7 and seven Panthers. First of all, the Panthers wearing all black with the black helmets. How did you think the Panthers looked in that in their gear? They looked very sharp. Yeah. I, uh, I did. Yeah, go ahead. I enjoyed that color scheme. Yeah, it looked cool. I like these different helmets and uh, uniforms we're seeing this year. I just wish that I had seen Baker Mayfield out there wearing it. Um, you know, he didn't get the start. Why do Why do you think the Panthers keep starting P.J. Walker over Baker Mayfield? You know, um, that's a question I, I can't answer. Maybe they feel like Baker's performing better coming off the bench. Yeah, but, I mean, he didn't play at all, so you're not getting that value, you know. I mean, I, I think – tell me if you agree. Baker Mayfield's clearly the better quarterback of the two, right? Absolutely. So is there like maybe some type of undisclosed injury or something? No, not that I've heard. I mean, that was a talk early on that maybe he was hurt, but um, I think the Panthers are just committed to losing out, committed to rebuilding and getting a high draft pick and maybe getting a quarterback in the draft. But uh, they don't seem too concerned with winning this season, which is pretty surprising. You know, and the fact that they win this game, you know, they surprise everyone, jump out to a 13 nothing first half lead and win 25 15 over the Falcons. I didn't see, I mean, I picked the Panthers to win this, but the Falcons are the better team, don't you think? Yeah, for sure. And I just think that Marcus Mariota kind of struggled a little bit. Yeah, I mean, it was raining. So that played a role in it. Marcus Mariota probably played the worst game of the season that he's played, and uh, the Falcons just didn't look good. Um, Deontay Foreman, the Panthers running back, goes for 130 yards and a touchdown. Good performance from him. I mean, he was on the Titans last year. Remember how well he filled in when Derrick Henry was hurt? Yeah, he played pretty well. Yeah, so he's solid. I think he's a borderline starter, uh, but he's an excellent number two running back. And LaVisca Chenault combines for 59 yards and a touchdown. So they're starting to get some production out of him. Um, J.C. Horn, son of Saints legendary wide receiver Joe Horn, uh, records an interception, his second of the season. I remember we liked J.C. Horn coming out of college, and he's uh, doing a pretty good job in the pros. Yep. Yeah, he sure is. Um, Do you remember Joe Horn from the Saints? I do. He was a legend, man. He was one of the best receivers in the game back back in his prime. Oh, yeah. Um, Marcus Mariota, 200-plus yards, two touchdowns and a pick. Some questionable decision-making the entire game, some, th- some throws he shouldn't be making. How about the one where he's, like, rolling and tries to throw the ball while he's, like, on his back on the field, nearly a pick six? Yeah. When I seen that, I was like, uh, come on, Marcus. You know, it reminded me of Carson Wentz last year when he played for Indy. Like, Yeah. As a quarterback, you can't make those reckless decisions like that. You got to protect the ball. 
And it, and Mariota seemed to be reckless with the ball the entire night. I, I think it was the rain, but it was also just some weird decision making from Marcus. Yeah, see, I think you can get a a half of a season good out of Marcus. I just don't think that you can expect to get a whole great season out of him, you know? I mean, he's won a playoff game before, you know, beating the Chiefs back in the day. So he's shown that he's capable of it. But in my opinion, Mariota's not a starting quarterback in the NFL. He's a uh, – I don't think he's that much better than P.J. Walker, you know. I think he's a good backup, don't you, don't you think? Or do you think he's a starter potential? I think he has starting potential for the right team, you know. Um, really, though – I think he's doing okay because Atlanta should be worse off. Like, to me, they should have a worse record because, you know, if you look at the talent on paper, it's not what their record indicates now. Yeah, four and six really isn't that bad of a record. When we were predicting this team to go like three or four and three and 14 or four and 13. So they're doing better than we thought. Um, Falcons rookie wide receiver Drake London leads the team with five catches for 38 yards and a touchdown. And we've been talking about this all year. Kyle Pitts held to just two catches for 28 yards. What do you think the issue is? Why can't the Falcons seem to get Kyle Pitts going? You know, I've I've uh, rewatched a couple, you know, because it, it had me wondering myself. He just doesn't seem to fit in that offense schematically for some reason. Yeah, and it, he did a lot better as a rookie with Matt Ryan. Maybe he doesn't have good chemistry with Mariota. Yeah, you know, and Matt Ryan was a pocket passer too. So it also, you know, Matt Ryan's first indication is to throw the ball. You know, he, he ain't going to take off. Matt Ryan's going to give you time to get yourself open. Yeah, and Mariota might, you know, because – when the offense is built around Matt Ryan, it's quick, snap the ball, read the read the field, and get the ball out. Mariota's more likely to hang onto the ball longer, try to extend the plays with his legs, and not be quite as on time as Matt Ryan would, right? Yep. And then, you know, by then, uh, maybe his first read isn't the tight end. Yeah. You know, that could be – to me, it just depends on – what kind of offense you're running because some coaches have played specifically for the tight ends, you know, the tight yeah, end. The their, their head coach, Arthur Smith is a, is a tight end friendly coach, you know, so it is weird to see, but you know, I, I think it's more so a Mariota thing. And I think the Falcons are kind of hurting their draft stock by winning as much as they are. So we'll see what they do at the quarterback position. I mean, in order to, I mean, is Desmond Ritter, how do you, is Ritter a potential starter or do they need to maybe move up in the draft or go through free agency and try to find somebody? I I think Ritter is going to be the future, you know, because yeah. I don't think they would have wasted that, that pick last year if they weren't going to get Desmond Ritter, you know, they would have got somebody else. I think I he's mean, a guy. You go back two years ago, they could have drafted Justin Fields, remember? Yep. Um, yeah. What do you think about – so looking at how the Panthers are underutilizing Baker Mayfield and maybe he's on the way out of town, what about potentially Baker Mayfield in Atlanta? Do, I mean, do you think that could be a good fit? He's kind of a pocket passer. They got weapons, Drake London, Kyle Pitts, that Zacchaeus, guys like that. Yeah. Um. I think he would be a great fit, but, you know, Baker needs to go to a team that's already, you know, uh, in my opinion, he needs to go to a team that's are, that's ready to win now. Yeah. You know, you have to put talent around Baker. And if you have less talent at the receiver positions, I just don't think that that's setting him up for success. Yeah, but, I mean, you, you know, Drake London, hell of a young, you know, prospect. Uh, Kyle Pitts, a lot of talent. And you, and you think about Cordero Patterson, the Falcons do have some talent, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So we'll see what they do this offseason. I don't think Mariota's the long-term plan. I don't, I'm don't. i not sold on Desmond Ritter really either. 
And so they're kind of and they're kind of playing their way out of high draft position. So we'll see what the Falcons do. They're in an interesting spot. Coming up, it's going to be my three and seven Bears at the four and six Falcons on Sunday. Um, do you think the Bears can go into Atlanta or do you and get a win, or do you give the advantage to the Falcons? You know what? I'm going to give the advantage to Chicago because I love the way Justin Fields has been playing. Yeah, I agree. He's been balling, but unfortunately, a lot of this success that Fields has had of late, especially on the ground, isn't translating to wins. What do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, you know, he's out there doing what he can do, you know, Alex, for he still doesn't have the greatest talent around him. Obviously, he's got to finish off the year like that. But let me tell you, for for him doing what he's doing, I, I think he just broke a rushing yard record. Michael Vicks, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, single game quarterback rushing record all time. Broke that yep. record from Michael Vick. Yep. So he's up there with Vick and Lamar Jackson and, you know, guys like that, which is pretty impressive for this being his second year or third year. Yeah. Yep. And, uh, you know, I so my take is I love the way Justin Fields is playing, but uh, there's not a lot of talent around him, and that's why it's not leading to wins. Um, and I expect the Falcons to get a win on Sunday in Atlanta. So. You know, the fields is not has never been the issue for me. It's the team around fields, and it's the organization itself. And that's why I had the Bears win in six games. And if they lose on Sunday and fall to three and eight, they're right there on pace to, to win six, right? Yep, for sure. Um, so we'll see if the Falcons can get a big win, get to five and six. You know, the division's still right there for the taking. No one's running away with that NFC South. And then the Panthers fall to three and seven and go to the six and three Ravens on Sunday. That's going to be a tough game. I got the Ravens. Do you? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm going to go Baltimore just because I think that they're playing well. They found their identity. Yeah, they seem to be. And guys like Roquan Smith and Kenyon Drake, two additions, are really helping this team out. So if, you know, I think the Ravens kick it to seven and three. And I don't really see, barring injury to a, to major players, I don't see why the Ravens can't win the division and have a home playoff game, right? Absolutely. And let me tell you, I don't know if anybody wants to see them at home. No, they're one of those teams that's a threat against anybody. Ravens Chiefs in the playoffs. Ravens Bills in the playoffs. Anybody. Uh, the Ravens are going to give them a hell of a battle, right? Absolutely. How about Sunday morning football in Germany? Uh, the six and three Seahawks against the four and five Bucks, and the Germans were out and ready for this game. There was the pictures of pregame. The crowd was all over, you know, out front of that stadium. People everywhere. The stadium was packed, and they were loud and singing throughout the game. It was a lot of fun and a, a like damn near like a Super Bowl kind of atmosphere at this game. You see that? Oh, yeah, yeah. i seen all the pictures, and uh, Pablo posted it on Twitter. I was like, that's why football is the greatest sport on earth, you know, and it was like, disagree, you know, because he's a big soccer fan, but. Yeah, but, I mean, even he knows that atmosphere for that game was crazy. And, uh, yeah. and the singing and just the passionate support, it was cool uh, seeing yeah. it throughout that game. How about that, man, just getting – Worldwide, I mean, we've had London, Germany, Monday night. I believe we are going to Mexico City. Yep, that's so, awesome. Yeah, it's cool to see. Um, so the Bucks jump out. You know, this is a must win for Tampa Bay, in my opinion. Did you feel the same way? Sitting at four and five, uh, needing to get on a winning streak. You know, they Tom Brady was clutch, got the win last week against the Rams. So now you're in Germany against the Seahawks. And again, it's a must win. Get to 500, get some positive momentum. The Bucks seem to be starting to click. They get out to a 14 nothing halftime lead, hang on to win 21 to 16. Now they're back at 500 at five and five and on a two game winning streak. That's scary for the rest of the league, isn't it? Absolutely. Um, you know, 
to me, every game moving forward is a must win. You know, because yeah. I mean, in that division, you could probably get an eight and nine team in there. Yeah, and win the division, right? I mean, potentially. Which is kind of sad to say, but that's just and, where we're at right now. And that's all that matters, really. That's why it's it, – we say it's must win because the record doesn't look good, four and five, five and five. But honestly, as long as you win the division and get into the playoffs and have a home playoff game, it doesn't really matter. All Brady and the Bucks want to do is get into the playoffs to win that division, right? Yeah. I don't and know. It, go ahead. I don't know if you remember some odd years ago when uh, I believe Pete, Pete Carroll uh, in one of his first couple of years had Seattle in the playoffs at seven and nine. Yeah. And uh, beat the Saints that year. Yep. yep. So, um, We'll see, but big win for the Bucks. They get back to 500. Tom Brady playing better. You know, that's part of the story, too, is that Brady and the Bucks offense was struggling during that down point of the season, and they just couldn't get their offense going. Now they seem to be clicking a little bit better. They're getting Julio Jones in the offense. He had a big touchdown in this game. Chris Godwin, Mike Evans. And a big aspect is that rookie tight end, Cade Otten, you know, Kyle Rudolph has not been the guy, and that rookie Kate Otten is stepping in, being that go-to tight end target for Tom Brady. You noticing that? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, they're going to need somebody to step up, especially with this being a year without Gronk. Yeah, and and so that's nice to see. Uh, if Kate Otten can step up and be that guy, then I'll have to take back my Gronk returning at some point this season take. I'll have to take that one away, strike that one from the record. I mean, it still could be a possibility if he's ring chasing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I would, but I'm not Gronk, so we'll see. And I'm not taking that beating that he takes every game, you know? Mm-hmm. How about Bucks rookie running back Rashad White uh, steps in, leads the team with 105 yards rushing, Fournette also 57 yards and a touchdown. Fournette and Rashad White looking to be a pretty good one-two punch for Tampa Bay at the running back position. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and that and that's what they need. Yeah, take some pressure off of Brady, and then be able to run on sec on like third and fourth and short, right? Yeah, I like Rashad when he was playing over in uh, Arizona State. Yeah, yeah, he seems to be a pretty good back. His skill set translates to the NFL game. Big game from linebacker Devin White. Records two sacks and a forced fumble. So far, he's got five sacks and two forced fumbles on the season. On pace for career highs in both. How about Devin White, at a, you know, former LSU linebacker? Uh, yeah, man. That's that's huge. That's That's what they need is one of those linebackers to start playing very well. You know, well, Devin White is an absolute monster, and I like Levante David as well. He is, but they were struggling for a little bit. You know, they were they having were, the ball. Go ahead. They were having the ball ran down their throats in, in, in a couple of the games that I watched. Yeah, but you're starting to see. So they lose uh, Shaq Barrett for the season, and who was one of the guys I talked about? Joe Tryon, and he stepped up in this game and made some plays. And Vita Vea is starting to play better as well. So you might be right. They were struggling at first, but they seem to be starting to get it going here the second half of the season, right? Yeah, and, you know, to me, I'm going to take Brady's early season struggles as, you know, he had a lot going on at home. And once he got that off his shoulders, he's playing very well now. Yeah, he's playing a lot better. So let's go to the Seahawks real quick. Six and four. No one expected them to be six and four. Geno Smith had been balling and playing some of his best football of the season, but in this game in particular, not a great showing from the rookie Kenneth Walker, not a great showing from Geno Smith. Are you still, you know, the Seahawks are six and four, leading the uh, NFC West, but do you trust the Seahawks to win that division or even make the playoffs? I tend, I tend to think that there's going to be a second-half 
fall off a little bit from Seattle. Do you think they can still make the playoffs? I don't think they're winning that division, right? No. Um, that division to me is pretty already figured out because I think the Niners are a damn good football team. Well, they're the best team, but they're still a game back of Seattle. And uh, the Rams and Cardinals are starting to fade away, don't you think? So it's kind of like a two-team race between uh, Seattle and uh, San Francisco. Yeah, and, you know, I'm saying when it comes down to it, I like San Francisco better. I agree. That's why I think at the end of the day, the the Niners are going to get enough wins to win the division. But do you think Seattle can get enough wins to sneak in as a wild card? I could see it being very possible. Yeah. And uh, they're not going to do it without Geno Smith continuing to play at a very high level and Kenneth Walker being being very impactful every week, right? Yeah, absolutely. But, you know, what's crazy, though, is what could stop some of them teams is, man, how good the NFC East is. Yeah, ex- exactly. And that's going to make it tough. You know, potentially two wild card teams could come out of the NFC East. Yeah. It, isn't that crazy? Yeah. I mean, that, that's what I like about the NFL season, too, is how, like, we never would have predicted the NFC East to have the best division in football. Yet here we are in week, week 10. Or, you know, so, uh, you know, that's just the game, and you never know. Um, Let's go to game of the week, game of the season. One of the craziest games I've seen in a long time. Seven and one Vikings at the six and two Bills. The Bills get out to a 27 to 10 third quarter lead. It looked like everything was going to script. And then the Vikings turned everything on its head. Uh, They rally and get the win 33 to 30 in overtime. Very improbable win. And an unbelievable ending. I mean, uh, so it starts with Josh Allen. The the Bills are up 27-17. They're looking to score and add to the lead and put this game away. But Josh Allen throws an interception in the end zone to Patrick Peterson. And that's really the big play that started the momentum swing that took points off the board for Buffalo and gives the ball back to Minnesota. Big momentum swing there. You know what I mean? Yeah, um, I agree. And Josh Allen has been struggling in the red zone lately. Yeah, you know, and this the Bills are on a two-game losing streak, and that's definitely in part due to Josh, Josh Allen's struggles. How about Justin Jefferson making catch of the year to convert a fourth and 18, bro? So – so many factors here. It's fourth and 18 with less than two minutes to go in regulation. So most people are thinking the game's over. The Vikings are going to turn the ball over on downs here, and the Bills are going to be able to ice the clock. And then on top of that, the catch. Did you see this catch, and how the hell did jo- Justin Jefferson pull this one in? First of all, the kid's talented. Beyond Very measure. talented. But, I mean, this catch, like, denied the laws of physics. Well, he wanted it more, Alex, to be honest. Yeah. I'm, he wanted it he, bad. And he, you know what? Kudos, kudos to Cousins, man. What a hell – that was a hell of a throw. Yeah. He put it – you know, he gave his guy a chance, you know, and Justin Jefferson goes up with one hand. And actually, the defender trying to make an interception, if you see at one point, there's no way Justin Jefferson should have kept the ball from hitting the ground and it should have been incomplete. But the defender's hand is actually underneath. So the defender trying to make a play actually helped Justin Jefferson make this catch. But this is one of this is right there with David Tyree's helmet catch as one of the most improbable things we've ever seen. Yeah. You know, it's up there with the Odell Beckham Jr. catch. Yeah. And on fourth and 18, you know, OBJ's wasn't on fourth down with the game on the line. This was. And one of the craziest things I've ever seen. Kudos to Justin Jefferson and a hell of a catch. And then, so the Vikings get all the way down to the one-yard line. Fourth and goal at the one with less than a minute to go and only one timeout remaining. 
So if they don't get it here, the game's over, more than likely, you know. Mm-hmm. Kirk Cousins tries to quarterback sneak it. He stopped just short, and that's the game, right? The game's over. They got only one timeout. They can't stop the clock. What would you do here? Amanda, you know, was messaging me saying that they should have taken a safety here. They're at the one-yard line. Take a safety. You still have the lead, and then you kick it back to Buffalo with a two-point lead or to Minnesota with a two-point lead. Would you rather do that or quarterback sneak it there with Josh Allen, who's a big-body quarterback, and trust that Josh Allen can pick up at least a yard and not get even a safety, you know, worst case scenario is that he fumbles here. So you trust Josh Allen to at least not fumble the ball, right? Absolutely. And I I can completely understand what Amanda was talking about. You know, that makes yeah. sense. But to me, if that, that was me, first of all, I'm going from shotgun. You're going from shotgun in the end zone? Absolutely. Why? Because – it's too cluttered right there, and Minnesota has a pretty good defensive line. And so, and so, if you are, if you make the impression to the Vikings defense that you're gonna quarterback sneak or run it up the middle there, just to be safe, then the Vikings are gonna pile all those guys right there at the line and try to stop you. You know, so I can understand your type of thinking to go shotgun there because then that negates the Vikings trying to stuff you. And see, and how about this? You go shotgun, you snap the ball, you do a little quick bubble pass to your wide receiver, the ball is at the two or three automatically because he's going to at least get one step up because you're going to bring at least one corner in if you're that close because you're going to want to bring the blitz off the outside. You know what I'm saying? So So you're going to either do a a quick pass to a receiver or even a, a running back or fullback leaking out, right? Yes. Yeah, I can see that. Um, if you had lined up in shotgun and I'm playing against you, I'd be I'd be like, oh shit, let's let's try and get a safety. So absolutely, I'm bringing the blitz. Uh, I'm bringing like an all out. I'm I'm doing engage eight on you. Uh, okay. But if you get the ball out quick enough, then I'm you know then I'm looking at at least probably a ten yard completion, right? Yep. But I don't care. The game's over anyways. But what's so crazy is the fact that I think the quarterback sneak with a big body guy like Josh Allen, he's been so successful on quarterback sneaks. I trust it. And even if he gets stopped and blown back and gets stopped for a safety, then you're still all right. You still got the lead and you play defense. The fact that, can you believe it, that he fumbled the snap and fumbled it in the end zone of the Vikings recover? Worst possible case scenario. And it, and it all backfires, and the Vikings recover and then have the lead. Yeah, and I believe, in my opinion, I think that's what they were trying to do was a quarterback sneak. Yeah. And, and I think it was just, as soon as he snapped the ball, there was perfect penetration. No, I don't think that was the push up the middle. I think Josh Allen just mishandled it. And that's not a shot at Josh. It happens. And sometimes, how many times have we seen throughout all the years we've been watching issues with the quarterback and center exchange, you know? Yeah, yep. And it just so happened that that, you know, mistake happened in that situation. And it's mind-blowing to think that that would happen there, but it did. And to his credit, so the Vikings go up three. The Bills take over with 36 seconds left, down three, and guess what? Josh Allen, doing what he does, leads them into field goal range, and they send the game to overtime. Even when everything goes wrong, Josh Allen finds a way to force overtime, you know? Absolutely, man. Let me ask you, dude, how the hell do you stop that man when he's running the ball? He's pretty tough. I mean, honestly, I would rather – do everything in my power to keep Josh Allen in the pocket and make him beat me with his arm. I can't let him get out there and run with his legs. And he's proven over the last couple games that you're much more likely to get him to to inter- throw an interception than uh, hit him and force a fumble on the run, right? Bro, yeah. This dude is what? 6'6", six, 6'7", six, six, I believe, right? Yeah. Huge body, Hurtling. lots of weight, and very Hurtling. fast and athletic. Defenders. Yeah. 
I mean, that's what he was doing to Kansas City, right? And that's how he beat the Chiefs, you know? Yeah, it's – but, like, you know, I mean, I just – and not only that, but he lowers his shoulder and he will run you over. Yep. Um. So, I mean, yeah, he's just so tough to defend. Um. So he goes and forces overtime 30-30. to 30. Um, did you see the Gabriel Davis catch on the final drive that should have been reviewed yeah, on replay? It was incomplete. Yeah. Yep. Um, I, I, I did see that, but didn't they do a hurry up snap? I think so. Yes. But if you're Minnesota, you got to be on that. If you're the league office, you got to be on that and take a look at that. They didn't, uh, the bill, I think the NFL secretly won it overtime, you know? Yeah. I mean, it was. I don't think the refs or anybody was expecting how that game was going to finish in the, uh, you know, in, in the four quarters. Yeah. And, I mean, overtime was just as crazy. Uh, the Vikings go down. Kirk Cousins leads them down. Greg Joseph hits the field goal to go up 33-30. The Bills drive down, looking like they're going to, you know, try to win the game. And Josh Allen intercepted again in the end zone and again by Patrick Peterson. The veteran corner, Patrick Peterson, man, still balling for Minnesota, and he got Josh Allen twice in the most crucial of times in this game. So, yeah, um, am I overreacting? This is a question for you, but, Alex, Minnesota is the real deal. Um, pump the brakes. Um, Min- what do you consider the real deal? I mean, is that division champions? Because if so, I agree. Dude, they – they're Super Bowl contenders. You can say that. You can you can like you can say they're Super Bowl contenders. They're they're among the best teams in the NFC. They got the record behind them. You know, if they get home field throughout the playoffs in Minnesota, that's a big advantage. You know, it gets loud in Minnesota. The Darius but, Smith is playing out of his mind. Who is? The Darius Smith. The Darius Smith and Justin Jefferson is too, and Kirk Cousins. We said it this offseason, going from uh, Zimmer, Mike Zimmer, to Kevin O'Connell, an offensive guy, I think is going to help Kirk Cousins a lot. And I, I think it has been so far. Do you agree? Absolutely. Uh, I think he's having one of the best seasons he's had in years. Yeah, of his career. And uh, so, but all that being said, can the Vikings win the division? Absolutely. They, I, I think they will. So that means they're going to have a home playoff game. Can they win a playoff game? Absolutely. Can they go to the conference championship? That I don't know. I have to see it first. That that requires multiple playoff wins, and I haven't seen it before. Last time, Kirk Cousins got his doors blown off by the Niners. Yeah, I mean, wouldn't that – aren't they currently tied right now with the Eagles for the for the one seed? Yes. They have the same record. So let me tell you, do you remember that uh, Minnesota-New Orleans Saints game, you know, the Minneapolis Miracle? Yeah. That place was loud that whole game. If yeah. if Minnesota can rack up home field advantage, watch out. Yeah. I mean, that's the route, right? They need it. Uh, you're going to need home field because this is what I'll tell you. If Minnesota has to go to Philly in the playoffs, give me the Eagles you know, all day. Mm-hmm. But if if Philly has to go to Minnesota, now we're talking. Maybe now Minnesota is right there with an opportunity to to win that, you know? Yep, for sure. So we'll see. Um, you know, uh, I'm not ready to crown the Vikings yet. I think they're division champs. I think they are going to be a team, a dangerous team in the playoffs, but – they got to prove it to me that they can not only get to the conference championship game, but win the NFC. And if they can get to the Super Bowl, now we're talking and I'll reevaluate the Vikings then. But, you know, I don't think, I think the Eagles, Niners, and Bucks are, are more, more contenders than the Vikings are to me at this time right now. Well, we'll get to the Eagles. I have a few things to say about them, so. Yeah, yeah, we will. Uh, plenty to talk about with them. Um, so we're talking about a snowstorm potentially in Buffalo against the Browns. Three and six Browns at the six and three Bills. 
Bills on a two-game losing streak. Um, they should be able to snap that on Sunday against uh, Cleveland, right? Absolutely. And by the way, for our listeners, Deshaun Watson has started practicing. Yes, uh, and he's set to return week 13. So and, Browns are looking forward to that. You know what? What if what if they can sneak a couple more games and then Deshaun comes back and they can finish out with only like six or seven losses, man? They could get into the playoffs. Well, so let's let's talk about that for a second. What kind of chances do you give the Browns of of giving the Bills a three game losing streak on Sunday in Buffalo in a snowstorm? Not much of a chance because that's the Bills' domain and. For some reason, the the Bills Mafia seem to love snowstorms. They do, um, but the argument I'll make is who better, who is better equipped to go in the snow than Nick Chubb and Kareem Hunt? Absolutely, good point. Because you know the Buffalo Bills still never got that marquee running back. Yeah. And, you know, Dalvin Cook was running on him on Sunday. So if Nick Chubb and Kareem can match that, and, uh, you know, who knows? But I give the advantage to Buffalo. I think the Bills are going to be pissed off. And the Bills do not want to be on a three-game losing streak. So they're going to be hungry to get this win and turn their season back around, you know? Yeah, and, you know, but the Bills – Defensive line is ranked in the top three in the league. So, yeah, you know, Chubb's, Chubb Chubb and them are going to have some issues running the football. Yeah, um, I think it's going to be. I I think the Bills are going to take care of business. You know, uh, the Browns might be built to to play that way. The Bills are just going to be pissed off, and I expect them to get that win. How about this though? Big test for the Vikings. I know they're going to be at home, but here come the six and three Cowboys. At the eight and one Vikings, Cowboys, they're in a tough division. They don't want to fall to six and four. They just lost to Green Bay. Can the Cowboys go into Minnesota and get a big win? They can, but they won't. Uh, I don't know. I think they're, I think they can. Um, that's going to be, uh, I'm going to have to wait until Sunday to make my pick on that game. You just I think, let me... What's up? You just let a struggling Green Bay Packers team who was on a five-game losing streak beat you. Yeah, and uh, I'm, we're going to talk about that coming up too. And the Cowboys kind of did that one to themselves a little bit. Um, so, yeah, I am going to lean Minnesota here. And that would be, you know, two straight losses for Dallas, you know? Yep. So, something to keep an eye on there. And a very tough division. So, they could quickly – I'll tell you this, if the Cowboys lose on a Sunday and fall to six and four, the Commanders play at the Texans. That's a very winnable game. If the Commanders win and the Cowboys lose, the Commanders will be just a half a game behind the Cowboys. That's wild. Yeah. Um, let's go to Lions at Bears, the two and six Lions at the three and six Bears. The Bears jump out to a 24 to 10 third quarter lead, but the Lions rallied to win 31 to 30 in Chicago. The Lions snapped their 13 game road losing streak. And it just so happens, what was the Lions' last road win? Who is it against? Uh, I'm going to guess Chicago. Yep, the Chicago Bears in 2020. So as a Bears fan, that pisses me off. I mean, what? how good have the Lions been the last five years? They're, they haven't been very good, but I keep telling you week after week, they're getting better. They're not that good. They shouldn't have won on Sunday. They're a two and seven quality ball club that got a win against a bad Bears team. Um, you know, uh, Justin Fields with a bad pick six to, you know, to Jeff Okuda, bad throw, bad mistake. He takes that one back. So that's a momentum swinging play. And late in the game, Cairo Santos with a missed extra point opened the door and the Lions won. But honestly, at the end of the day, trading away Roquan Smith and, and Robert Quinn isn't going to make your defense better. 
and our defense is bad right now in Chicago, and that's the re- that's the reason we're losing games. Our offense can put up points. You're seeing it, but our defense can't stop anybody, you know? Yep, I have to agree with you on that. And it's frustrating. Um, Jared Goff throws for 200-plus yards, one touchdown, no turnovers. That's the key, man. If Jared Goff can go turnover-free, it gives the Lions a much better shot at winning games. It's just that he doesn't have turnover-free games that often, you know? Yep, that, that's very true. Um, big, You know, good game from Jamal Williams. Scores the go-ahead touchdown late. Amon Ross St. Brown, 10 catches for 119 yards. And defensive end Julian Okora gets two sacks for the Lions. Fields combines for 300 yards, two touchdowns and a pick. Cole Komet, two touchdowns receive and 74 yards receiving. How about this guy, undrafted rookie linebacker out of Wisconsin, Jack Sanborn, uh, records two sacks, the first two sacks of his NFL career uh, for the Bears. Uh, do you remember Jack Sanborn from Wisconsin? Absolutely. And le- let me tell you, that kid's a baller. That's Yeah, he's kind of a dog. That's a uh, – I like that for, like, as, as, as the future of Chicago, you know, because Chicago seems to get – you know, generational linebackers like it's nothing. Yeah. You know, with and, Ur- Urlacher, then Roquan. Sanborn yeah. could be next. I mean, let's go back even further. Let's go Singletary. Let's go Buckus, you know? Yep. yep. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm shocked. Looking at his skill set, looking at his talent, what he's given the Bears, I'm shocked he went undrafted. Yeah, me too. And, um... Shoot, he tore. He uh knocked some heads when I when I went to uh Notre Dame versus Wisconsin and Soldier Field last year. Yeah, he was hitting pretty hard. Absolutely. Um, so we already talked about Bears Falcons. You're taking the Bears. I'm taking the Falcons in Atlanta. Yeah, I'm taking Chicago. And that's a Ryan Pace revenge game as he's now the Falcons uh, GM. Oh. <laughs> um, three and six Lions at the seven and two Giants. Lions on a two game winning streak. Let's go ahead and put that winning streak to bed. All right. Uh, pump the brakes. You're taking the Lions to go into MetLife and beat the Giants. Absolutely. All right. Give me the Giants. I'll keep taking those L's from Dustin. You got lucky the last two weeks with Detroit. You're not getting it this week. I told you, I, I'm I'm going to ride with them boys most of the season. All right, well, you're going to ride to a solid six-win season. <laughs> hey, that's fine. <laughs> uh, Jags at Chiefs. Not many, you know, people didn't expect much out of this game. Neither did I. Um, the Chiefs jump out to a 20 to nothing first-half lead and win 27-17 in Arrowhead. Patrick Mahomes, 350-plus yards, four touchdowns, two turnovers. Travis Kelsey, 81 yards receiving and a touchdown. But more importantly, uh, Valdez Scantling catches his first touchdown as a Chief, and Kadarius Toney catches his first career NFL touchdown. The, The Chiefs can only get better with the emergence of Valdez Scantling and Kadarius Toney, right? Yeah, and that surprises me that that Valdez hasn't caught one all season long. Yeah. Except for Sunday. Yeah, me too. And so it's good to see him finally get going. How about the addition of Kadarius Toney? Um, He never did much in New York, but do you think he looked pretty good on Sunday and he might be a valuable addition for Kansas City? Yeah, absolutely. You know, again, uh, a lot of times it's all about the system you're in. Yep. And You know, I mean, Daniel Jones really – he's a passer, but he's not as efficient as Mahomes. If you want the ball, Patty's going to find you. Yeah, I mean, how happy must Kadarius Tony be to go from Joe Judge and Daniel Jones to to Andy Reid, Eric Bieniemy, and Patrick Mahomes, right? Yeah, with a legit chance to get a ring. Yeah. Um 
going to week 11, the uh, seven and two Chiefs on Sunday night football at the five and four Chargers. Big game on national TV. How do you see that one going? I'm going to go with the Chiefs. You're going to go with the Chiefs to go into SoFi and beat Justin Herbert and the Chargers? I didn't like the performance of the, of the Chargers against the Niners. I feel like yeah. the Chargers should have won that game. Yeah, I agree. The Chargers have done that a lot this year. Lost games that, that were very winnable. Uh, but they're at home. Um, they're going to be pissed off by the way they've lost a couple of these games. Give me the Chargers on Sunday night. Can I ask, why did that game get flexed? What, Chiefs Chargers? Yeah, because I, I thought that that – that was not originally the Sunday night game. I'm not sure, but I mean, I like it. It's a divisional game. Both teams with playoff expectations. It's a big game. And you know how NBC loves their quarterbacks. This is a perfect matchup, Patrick Mahomes and Justin Herbert. Yeah, absolutely. So they're going to be slobbing on that, you know, all game long. <laughs> uh, th the Jags head to their bye week at three and seven. How do you how do you see the Jags thus far through the season through ten games sitting at three and seven? Did you expect more from Jacksonville? They're there, you know. They're there. They're in a lot of games, right? Even the ones they're losing, they're in, they're they're competitive, right? Yes, absolutely, and that's a big step. Yeah, and they're they're building. You know, they're a long rebuild, and uh, and. Uh, taking steps in the right direction. So, you know, I'm not worried about it. Trevor Lawrence has star written all over him. So, um, He has but, to really start showing it ne next season. Yeah, and they need to surround him with more talent too. I mean, Christian Kirk shouldn't be your number one wide receiver. So I'd like to see the Jags continue to build and get better and better, on, especially on offense. Um. The three and five Browns at the six and three Dolphins. Dolphins lead 17 to seven at halftime. It was actually competitive in the first half, but Miami runs away with it in the second half, 39 to 17 for their fourth straight win. If you remember, the Dolphins were three and three during the Tua concussion, you know, controversy and drama. Now they're on a four game winning streak, sitting at seven and three. How are you feeling about the Dolphins? Well, this is where I believe we have another disagreement. And you know what I'm about to say, right? What's that? So, look, I know that I have the Bills winning the Super Bowl, but let me tell you, Miami is a dark horse. A dark horse Super Bowl? Yes. Nah, they're not a Super Bowl team. Are you kidding they me? That team is talented. They're not. They're not. They haven't played anybody, really. Like, the, during this four-game winning streak, let's pull up their, who they've played. Because it hasn't been having, that Tua good. Two is having an MVP season. Yeah, but, I mean, I want to see what he does in January. You know, I, to me, this is my gut on Miami. Great regular season team. If they get into the playoffs and play a wild card game, they're not winning a playoff game, in my opinion. And so, I mean, you agree. You got the Bills winning the division, right? Yeah. So if the Bills win the division, Miami's playing on the road. And I don't trust Tua to win his first playoff game in his career on the road. I just like them, man. They have talent. You can like them. You, can, you know, you can think they have a bright future. I just, let's not get carried away with, the Dolphins needing to win a lot and go on a deep playoff run this year. Cause I don't, I think that's a little, a couple years too early. They've got talent, but they've got a quarterback that's never won in the playoffs, never even played a playoff game. And you've got a rookie head coach that frankly gives me a lot of Mark Trestman vibes and I'm not sold on him. What was Mark Trestman's playoff record as head coach? I can't remember that one. Oh and oh, he never even made one. Despite having the second best offense in the entire NFL. Doesn't that remind you of someone? Doesn't that <laughs> sound like Mike McDaniel? Yep. So I I agree the Dolphins are talented and something to keep an eye on 
The Dolphins are seven and three. What are the Bills? Seven and three. Six and three. The Dolphins are actually leading that division now. So let me ask you, any thought that the Bills might not win the AFC East? I think the Bills win it. All right, and I agree, but, man, they better, you know. I mean, it's Super Bowl expectations, right? That starts with winning the division, not getting in as a wild card, right? Yeah, because they would have the most – the. You know, teams do not want to go on Buffalo in January. Exactly. But, I mean, you know, we'll see on Miami. Let's not forget who, who has the head-to-head between so far between Miami and Buffalo. Miami. Yeah. So, they'll be tied at 7-3 and three if the Bills win on Sunday. The Dolphins have a bye week in week 11. Let's go Texans-Giants. The 1-6-1 one, and one Texans at the 6-2 and two Giants. Giants win 24-16, improved to 7-2. and two. Daniel Jones, this is the big key, bro. Dan- the two big keys to the Giants' success. Daniel Jones, two touchdowns, no turnovers. Daniel Jones has gotten a lot better at protecting the ball. And Saquon Barkley rushes for 150 yards and a touchdown. Saquon Barkley's resurgence along with Daniel Jones protecting the ball. That's why the Giants are winning. Absolutely. And let me tell you, Daniel Jones hasn't thrown a pick since I think the stats said week three. Wow. That's incredible. So, I mean, yeah. Um, Keep an eye on the Giants. As they continue to win, the Cowboys are starting to lose. The Giants are just a half a game behind the Eagles. Or, no, what are they? One full game, one game behind the Eagles. Um. So, I mean, if you're picking, are you going to stand by your pick, Lions, to go into New York and get a win? I am. All right. I'm going to go ahead and make this one my guarantee of the weekend. The, the Lions are not going into New York and beating the Giants. Giants are winning this one. I'll go ahead and say by double digits. Oh, that's total disrespect. Yeah, but I'm used to giving Detroit total disrespect. They've earned it. <laughs> <laughs> Detroit by five. Huh? Detroit by five. Yeah, well, text me when you get your sanity back. <laughs> um, five and five commanders at the one and seven and one Texans. No reason the commanders shouldn't go into Houston and get, a, get above 500, right? Yeah, uh, Houston's taking another loss. Um, Saints at Steelers, three and six Saints at the two and six Steelers. Pittsburgh star linebacker TJ Watt returns from a torn peck that he suffered in week one. Honestly, bro, the Steelers, uh, well, the game tied at 10 at halftime. The Steelers pull away to win 20 to 10 in the second half. The big reason a lot of people are talking about why the Steelers are so bad this year the biggest reason the Steelers are having a bad year is because of that T.J. Watt injury. That single-handedly derailed their season. Do you agree? To to a certain extent, but I think Mitchell Trubisky being benched also derailed it. Yes, but that the reason is because they were losing because T.J. got hurt. Um, if they were winning with Mitch and T.J. was healthy – then uh, Mitch doesn't get benched and the Steelers are a lot more competitive, right? Yeah, and I was expecting better production out of Najee, too. Yeah, and that offensive line is an issue in Pittsburgh, as well as the offensive coordinator. Uh, Good game for Kenny Pickett, combines for 250 yards and a touchdown, no turnovers. Najee Harris actually has a decent game, goes for 99 yards. Uh, Andy Dalton throws for less than 200 yards and two turnovers. Um, how about them Saints three and seven and looking like they're, you know, they're in a bad division. So still technically alive, but the Saints just don't look like a very good team this year. Do they? No, you know, uh, am I crazy for saying that that I still got, that I still like and got faith in Andy Dalton? Yes, because the Saints would be more competitive if they started Taysom Hill, don't you think? Or Jameis Winston, who's fucking healthy and the Saints won't play him. Don't you, yeah. don't you think? 
Jameis or Taysom would give the Saints a better shot to win. Yeah, have you heard about why they're not playing him? They think Dennis Dennis Allen, the head coach, thinks that Andy Dalton gives them the best chance to win. That is egregious, bro. Yeah, he needs to. Someone needs to uh, wake him up. You know, I guarantee you, Sean Payton wouldn't be playing Andy Dalton right now. Hell no, Sean Payton would be playing Jameis Winston and then like using some type of package for Taysom Hill. Exactly. Uh, so I don't know what's going on in, in New Orleans. Uh, the three and six Rams at the three and seven Saints on Sunday. Uh, we'll see if Stafford plays, bro. Uh, a lot of rumblings about Stafford with a concussion. Like he's still technically in concussion protocol. Wow. And uh, his wife went on a rant on a podcast about how unsafe she felt about Stafford's concussion. And uh, some people are wondering if Stafford might be considering shutting it down for the season. Really? Yes. That's what's going on in L.A. right now. Wow. What do you think on that? Is it is it – should Rams fans be upset that Stafford, you know, is considering shutting it down? Or do you think, you know what, it's a lost season at this point? I mean – to me, it's still not a lost season. Yeah. But, but at the same time, Matthew Stafford shouldn't really have the care because he has to do what's best for himself. Yeah, but, I mean, tell that to Ram fans, you know. We can yeah. sit there and say that, do what's best for you, but if you're a fan of the Rams, you're like, fuck no, get back on the field, right? Yeah, but if a doctor says he can't, then that's not his fault. Well, I think that's the problem, though. It's not a doctor saying he can't. It's more so Stafford saying, considering shutting himself down for the season. And and maybe that's a conversation that he needs to have with McVay because they asked Sean McVay about it, and he didn't have any answers. Yeah, then that's when he's got to sit down and have a talk with him. Yeah, and get on the same page. Uh, so who do you got winning? I mean, Stafford might or might not play. At the three and seven Saints. So let's say it's John Wolford. That should be a win for the Saints, right? No. Uh, as much as Andy Dalton sucks, give me the Saints. <laughs> I'm going to go as, Ram. As much as Andy Dalton sucks, he's better than John Wolford. Um, and, then, and then a big game, five and four Bengals at the three and six Steelers. Bengals are going to be wearing their white helmets again. Honestly, bro, keep an eye on this game. It's a divisional game. T.J. Watt's back. Kenny Pickett's playing a little better. The Steelers, Bengals might be on upset alert here. Bengals by two scores. Oh, I I can understand you saying Bengals. I can't understand you saying two scores. Give me the Steelers outright. Ooh. Um... Let's go Broncos at Titans. Three and five Broncos at the five and three Titans. Ryan Tannehill returns from the ankle injury. Broncos jump out to a 10 nothing first half lead, but the Titans come back and win 17 to 10. Ryan Tannehill, two touchdowns, no turnovers. Uh, both touchdowns thrown to Nick Westbrook Aquina. I've been talking about this for a while now. I like Nick Westbrook Aquina. Do you? Yep, yep, he's he's talented. The only problem is you get you get rid of both Julio and AJ Brown in the same offseason, and Nick Westbrook goes from option number three to option number one, and that's a lot more attention paid to him on you know from the defense. But you know what? I thought about this as much as I dislike Tennessee. Yeah, man, Brable is a hell of a coach, dude. Yes, you have to get. Yeah, you can hate the Titans all you want. You have to give Mike Vrabel uh, his credit, absolutely. I mean, like, you're playing with a good quarterback, not a great quarterback. You just lost two of your best wide receivers, yep. you know, and Derrick Henry got injured last year, and you still made the playoffs. Yep, absolutely. Right. So, um, they're you know, credit to them. They get to 6-3, and three, a big win. And they're trying to win that division, you know. They got to be the favorite right now. Uh, Russell Wilson throws for 250 yards, touchdown and a pick. 
uh, Broncos undrafted rookie Jalen Virgil makes a 66-yard touchdown for his first career NFL catch. How about that? Your first catch goes for a 66-yard touchdown. Yeah, that had to be nice. Yeah, undrafted rookie Jalen Virgil. Um, if Denver misses the playoffs, which seems likely, sitting at, what, three and six, it's got to be firing Nathaniel Hackett after one season, right? You would think. Yeah, they're too talented to be missing the playoffs. So, yeah, him and Russell Wilson do not work together. No, and it's going to be interesting to see what happens to Nathaniel Hackett. Like, does he go back to Green Bay or what happens? So, um, six and three Titans tomorrow night at the four and six Packers on Thursday night football. Big ass game at this point of the season, bro. It's must win. It's the playoffs for the Packers. They got a big win over Dallas. Can they make it two in a row at home against the Titans on Thursday night? Who do you think I'm picking? I think you're picking Green Bay. Yes, sir. Because the fact that it's going to be super cold. Yeah. And, you know, a little bit snowy. You think so, it's, it's supposed to snow? Do you know? Um, I heard flurries at times, but still. You know, yeah. That... Um, I mean, I, I might pick the Packers to win that just to be nice to Josh and Amanda. Uh, but I could easily, <laughs> I could easily see the Titans getting the win, though. You know what I mean? Green Bay needs to prove that they're back. Dallas could have been just an outlier, you know. Uh, Christian Watson needs to go for three touchdowns again. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So big game, though. You know, Packers can't afford to fall to four and seven. So they're in must-win territory. You know, the crowd's gonna be loud at Lambeau. So we'll see how Tannehill and the Titans perform on the road. Uh, two and seven Raiders at the three and six Broncos on Sunday. The Raiders just look done, don't you think? Is this an opportunity for Denver to get to four and six and, and maybe keep their season alive a little bit? Yeah, and you know, Alex, I, Josh McDaniels may be another one out in his first year. So Bill Plaschke, you know him, right? Yep. Covers LA sports. He said today on a podcast, he said that the Raiders don't have any money, that the Raiders are strapped for cash, and due to Josh McDaniels' contract, he expects McDaniels to be the coach next year. But How they, are they so broke? I don't know. I don't know if he's telling the truth or not. That's just what Bill Plaschke said. But how surprised would you be if Josh McDaniels is the coach again next year? Pretty surprised because, man, the Vegas fans are not going to put up with that, especially Raiders, you know. Uh, they need fans. to be loud. They need to be pissed, you know. Yeah. And mm-hmm. that's the thing is that Mark Davis would have to admit that he was wrong, you know, with that hire. And uh, that's a hire that he wanted. So we'll see well, what, what goes on in Vegas. Mark Davis had the chance, you know, to – go to the college rankings and get somebody. And I think he would have went there too. If you Who's were that? Because you Harbaugh. know how I feel about college coaches. Harbaugh? Yeah. Yeah. My personal belief is that Jim Harbaugh is not leaving Michigan for anywhere but one job. Chicago? Yes. I could be wrong. Um, you know, and I, I do think Harbaugh wants to come back to the pros and get that elusive Super Bowl. But, man, things are going pretty good at Michigan right now. It's got to be hard to leave, you know? Yeah, it does. It does. Um, let's go to your Colts at the Raiders. Three five and one Colts at the two and six Raiders. Interim head coach Jeff Saturday making his NFL head coaching debut. Um, only His only coaching experience is high school. So a big moment for Jeff Saturday. And with the move, he moves Matt Ryan back to starter. You got to be happy with that move to put Matt Ryan back out there. Absolutely. Frank Reich was an idiot not having him play. But let me tell you this. So the fact this falls, I know you want to blame Frank Reich, and Frank Reich was the problem. 
but this falls on Jim Ursay for allowing Frank Reich to make that move. I said it at the time, if Frank Reich came into my office and tried to pitch me to bench Matt Ryan and put Sam Ellinger out there, I would have fired Frank Reich right then and there. Do you blame Jim Ursay for that failed experiment and two losses that didn't necessarily need to happen? To a certain extent, because he is the owner, but here's here's how I see it is like you know, what I think happened was if Matt Ryan didn't hurt his shoulder, I think he still starts in the first place. Yeah. The shoulder injury gave them an excuse to wanna try, you know, to see what Sam Ellinger could do. And but then- so was Frank Reich just talking out of his ass when he said that was the move regardless of Matt Ryan's injury? Yeah, he sure was. Doesn't that make Frank Reich look like a clown? <laughs> it it does, but, you know, I'm just glad that, that they woke up and seen that Matt Ryan and stopped making him the fall guy for all the problems. Yeah, exactly. Frank Reich should have been the fall guy, not Matt Ryan. And let me um, tell you, Matt Ryan played some damn good football on Sunday. Yeah. Uh, so, and we'll get to the game in a second. How did you feel about the move naming Jeff Saturday, who wasn't on the staff? We assumed it was going to be Gus Bradley, the interim head coach. How did you feel about the move going to Jeff Saturday? Okay, so hear me out, right? This, it shocked me a lot. Like, I was very, very shocked, you know, because he was – I was just watching him that morning on ESPN. Yeah, on, I know. On, on uh, Get Up with Mike Greenberg and them. And uh, I look over and I'm like, Jeff Saturday is the head coach of Indy. That can't be true. And it did end up being true. I like it because he brings energy. They're saying that the practices are different now. Yeah. You know, he's bringing energy. He's had, has the guys fired up. But at the same time, I would have liked to have seen what Gus Bradley could have did. Yeah. And my gut tells me that the move, because common sense said Gus Bradley. But I feel like Ursay didn't think that Gus Bradley was going to be the long-term guy. And I don't think he wants to wait until the offseason to make his move. I think Jim Ursay knows who he wants to be the head coach of his Colts. And I think he's already made the move. I think we might as well take that interim tag off of Jeff Saturday. I think that Jim Ursay wants Jeff Saturday to be the long-term head coach of this team. Do you agree with that? Do you think I'm on to something? It, it, it makes a lot of sense. You know, it does. But, like, do you think maybe they were already discussing behind closed doors? Ursay did know that he was going to let Wright, grow, uh, Wright go sooner and, like, him and Saturday were – keeping things on the down low? I do, yes. I don't think that Saturday was surprised by this. I think this is a move that has they've been having conversations before. But, you know, and you can see the thing. Saturday has had been a head coach for one game, and that old line already looked improved. Yeah, and, and that's the guy, right? He's a former offensive lineman. That kind of makes some sense. You got to build to the trenches, and that's how Indy wants to play, in the trenches. Dominate the trenches, feed Jonathan Taylor, you know. And our defense is actually ranked in the top five in the National Football League. How about, let me let me spell out a scenario for you, a, a, you know, a what-if scenario for next season. And okay. tell me if you would like this. Let's say week one, 2023. Colts head coach, Jeff Saturday. Colts offensive coordinator, Nathaniel Hackett. Colts quarterback, Aaron Rodgers. I can't tell you what I would do over the podcast, so (laughs) I'm just playing. Yeah, because you'd be doing gay stuff because you like Aaron Rodgers too much. (laughs) I love Aaron Rodgers. I think I have a man crush on him. (laughs) But, uh, that so, would make me excited. It would be Super Bowl or bust. Yeah, but then a lot of the people that don't like the Colts would be telling you, look at Indy. 
They go from one old quarterback to another. It goes Phillip Rivers. It goes Matt Ryan. It goes Carson Wentz. Now we're going Aaron Rodgers. This isn't just no old quarterback, okay? <laughs> All right, let's get, let's get into this game. Colts jump out to a 10 nothing first half lead. Hang on to win 25-20 in Vegas. Dustin, I know you disagree with me. Uh, you've seen the replay plenty of times. I thought this is my thought process here. You're in Vegas. The Raiders' season is on the line. They're driving down to potentially take the game-winning score late in the fourth quarter with a, you know, a packed home crowd. I thought there was enough contact on the fourth down throw to Devontae Adams in the end zone that I would have thrown a pass interference flag given the Raiders' first and goal at the one and given the Raiders an opportunity to get a big win at home and kind of salvage their season. You're a Colts fan. You don't give a shit about the Raiders. What did you think of that final play? Was there any chance that there was defensive pass interference? Look, I I watched it three or four times just because I knew you were going to bring this question up because we discussed it. Yeah. Um, you know, it's 50-50, Alex. I mean, yeah. Adams I made contact first. Yep. You know, and you had a point about turning your head, but once the receiver makes contact, I believe the quarterback can also make contact. He can, but I believe – I could be wrong, but I believe the the focus is on if he's got his head turned around looking at the ball because they want the emphasis to be the defender playing the ball as opposed to the defender playing the receiver, you know? Yeah, I mean, you have to give the benefit of a doubt. I mean, you know, it's not like the guy who was guarding Adams was uh, – a rookie uh, year starter, you know, yeah. it was it was a legit three time pro bowler and former defensive player of the year. Yes. And that's why I think it wasn't called. It was a because of Gilmore's reputation. But Devontae's got a reputation, too. And yeah. I agree. It was a 50 50. It could have gone either way. And I'm not saying that it was the wrong call. I'm saying it surprised me that it wasn't called based on the way the NFL has officiated you know, in the, in the past, they seem to oh. like, you know, they seem to bail teams out. Right. Trust me. I I was sitting there for a good, even three minutes after it, it was an incomplete pass. I'm like, Oh, these zebra stripes are going to throw it. I know they are. Yeah. But they didn't. And a big road win for Indy uh, to get to, you know, four five and one. That's honestly not that bad. You're one win away from 500. Matt Can Ryan I say something ball? real quick? Yeah. Man, Stefan Gilmore, Alex, has really kept us alive. Yeah. A lot of people thought he was washed at this point in his career. He's had a pretty good season. Absolutely not. We lose two more games because if he doesn't step up. He would have lost that Broncos game for sure. Man, I he's turning into one of my favorite players on the Colts, man, because – he saved us a lot. Yeah, and he's that veteran leadership on the defensive side of the ball. You know, it's been such a tough year for Indy with Shaq Leonard being hurt all season. And now and out for the year officially, Gilmore you know, has really stepped up and been that defensive leader. Yeah, did you know that Indy's defense is ranked in the top five or six? Yeah, that's a very impressive considering Shaq Leonard's been hurt. Yeah, well, Zaire Franklin, who leads – uh, is one, one, two, or three in the league in tackles. Yeah, absolutely. Um, big game from Matt Ryan, 200-plus yards, one touchdown, no turnovers. Big game from Jonathan Taylor, 150-plus rushing – or 150-plus yards, one touchdown. Anytime you get Matt Ryan, that was the big issue, right? Matt Ryan turning the ball over. No turnovers, that's a recipe for a win. And guess what, though? What mm -hmm. happened? Jonathan Taylor was crapping it out all season long with Reich, right? You get a yep. young guy who's calling plays, who knows what he's doing, and guess what? He exposed for almost 150 yards. Yeah, and I think that's going to be Saturday's mindset, establish the run, play defense, you know? Absolutely, and you don't under – like, 
some people don't understand how big that is for somebody like Matt Ryan. You give yeah. him a run game, and he's and he's efficient enough to get you to where you have to go. Absolutely. And so, I mean, considering where you were with Frank Reich and where you're at right now, the playoffs are still an option. And that's why I never understood the move around Matt Ryan, you know, at 500. And now you're seeing you're a win away from being back to 500. Um, but a big game in week 11 as the 8-1 and one Eagles come into Indy. Big-ass game. The Colts, you know, damn near a must win. The Colts need to win out. They at least, you know, need to uh, get it back to 500 and above. How do you feel about the chances with the 8-1 and one Eagles coming in off a loss but a very talented team? They are very talented. But you know what, though? The Colts seem to play the talented teams pretty well. I mean, yeah. we knocked off the Chiefs. Yep. You know, we've knocked off some pretty good talented teams this year. It seems like the teams who we should beat, we don't play well against. Yeah. You know, so I, I'm worried to a certain extent, but if you can do the formula of watch the film on, on how the commanders beat them, you know, running the football, having a couple – Terry McLaurin stepping up, you know. We we need that from Paris Campbell, who has gotten better. Yeah, I think the commanders were like 80% on third down conversion. And that's something you got to do. Run the ball with success, and then Matt Ryan, convert third downs, keep the offense on the field, wear down that Eagles defense, and keep Jalen Hurts and A.J. Brown and Miles Sanders on the sideline. Yeah, and see, and if you can wear down – that defense, they showed me in the Commanders games that they can make some knucklehead, exhausted-type plays that are going to make them lose. Yeah, the Eagles are hurting without Jordan Davis. Jordan Davis was really helping out their run defense. And so there's an opportunity for Jonathan Taylor. And then a key, the Eagles, I believe, are leading the league in takeaways. So Matt Ryan, if he can have another zero turnover game, that would be huge. Yeah, or how about Ryan uh, running down the field like Usain Bolt against the Raiders? And that's the thing, man. If you allow Matt Ryan to run at this age for like 40 yards, you're not going to win a game. <laughs> yeah, it was impressive. But, yeah, man, it's, the Colts can win that game. Leave no doubt about that. Yeah, uh, I mean, I might pick the Colts to win that. Uh, and give put the Eagles on a losing streak. In fact, let me just go ahead and say it. I'm going to pick the Colts to win. It's in Indy. It's going to be loud in that place. Yeah, that would be a game to go to, bro. You should try to get some tickets for that one. I mean, I liked the Commanders game. I had fun, you know, but I was going there. I would have saved it for the Eagles game, but I was like, you know, Commanders, which isn't too bad, and I thought Matt Ryan – was going to play, I found out three days after I purchased the tickets. Yeah, and that was supposed to be Carson Wentz revenge game, right? Yep. So, um, the, uh, so yeah, I mean, the Raiders season looks about shot. I expect them to lose at Denver. So, Raiders staring down a two and eight. And who would have thought the Raiders would be two and eight with Derek Carr, Devontae Adams, all this talent, Josh Jacobs, and can't get it done. Yeah, but I do like that Raiders tight end, Moro. He's going to be good. Yeah, he's a hell of a tight end number two, and he's filling in nicely with Waller out. Yeah, uh, let's then, Game of the week, six and two Cowboys. Well, not game of the week because of Vikings and Bills, but a big game, six and two Cowboys at the three and six Packers. Cowboys lead late, 28 to 14 in the third but the Packers rallied to win 31-28 in overtime, snapped their five-game losing streak. First of all, uh, did you pick the Packers to win this like I did? Actually, I believe I thought I picked Dallas. So let's go ahead and give Alex, I mean, because everyone, you guys know Alex picked the Packers to win this. I was telling Amanda and Josh that I think Green Bay can actually win this game. That's a pretty good call by me, huh? Snap that five-game losing streak against a, a pretty good Cowboys team. Let me say, you've been pretty hot this season so far. 
Yeah, my favorite pick of the weekend was on Monday night, and we're going to talk about that in a few. Um, but let's ignore the picks. Impressive win for Green Bay with their backs against the wall to get that win, huh? Yes, and somebody arrived on the scene. And I think yeah. it's not just a fluky, a, a fluky good game for him. Yeah, rookie wide receiver Christian Watson. I mean, we had been talking about this on the podcast. Where was Christian Watson? Romeo Dobbs had been the productive wide receiver, and Christian Watson was nowhere to be found up until this game. Yeah, I think he was just trying to find himself. And, yeah. you know, a game like this, a three-touchdown game, gives you confidence. Yeah, he didn't exactly – this wasn't a five catches, 60-yard, one touchdown, finally a good game. This was a monster game. Uh Where's his stats? Three touchdowns, four catches, 107 yards, and three touchdowns. The first, I mean, first receiving touchdown of his NFL career, and he catches three in the same game. But he's going to need to do that going forward. This isn't a nice story. This is out of necessity. Aaron Rodgers and the Packers need his skills. And he needs to put up numbers like this the rest of the season, right? Absolutely. And like I said, this game would give a young receiver confidence. Yeah, absolutely. Knowing that you can, hey, I just scored three TDs against a pretty damn good defense. I mean, a damn good defense. Yeah. You know, Trayvon Diggs or Travion Diggs and all them guys. That's not Mike, easy to score on. Micah Parsons, Demarcus Lawrence, et cetera. Yes, those guys are not easy to score on, man. And he he gained confidence, and I believe that was just the beginning. How about Mike McCarthy, former Packers head coach, now Cowboys head coach, deciding to go for it on fourth and three from the Green Bay 35 in overtime instead of kicking a 53-yard field goal that would have put him in, into the lead. What do you think of that decision? That's – that's why the Cowboys are the Cowboys, bro. I mean, uh, was Mike McCarthy the wrong hire, do you think, for the Cowboys? That has yet to be seen to me because, I mean, he did have them in the playoffs. Yeah, but when you're making decisions like that at the end of games, it's costing your team wins, valuable he, wins in a very tough division. He's not I mean, the only one in the league doing that, though. I just think, bro – this is this is the type of move, right? The Cowboys are 6-2 and two going into this game. It's a game they're expected to win. And when Mike McCarthy was not on the hot seat at all, you know, about to be 7-2, and two, um, right there in the conversation to win the division. But when Mike McCarthy goes and makes a decision like this, you lose a big game, you fall to 6-3, and three, I'm just telling you, this is a move, this is a decision that's going to be looked back on at the end of the year. And it's going to be in, in a bowl along with other decisions that's going to make Jerry Jones say, you're out of here. I'm you're firing you after this season, and I'm going to go get Sean Payton. That's my, that's my prediction. Well, let me tell you, uh, first of all, um, Kellen Moore may need to also have to be moved. Yes. But, Can you believe Kellen Moore was getting head coach consideration last year? Well, last year he was better at calling plays, in my opinion. Well, I never bought the hype. I was never a Kellen Moore guy. And uh, he, the issues were fundamental. And uh, the issues, those issues are why they lost this game. Because what do we talk about going back to when Cooper Rush was the quarterback? What Mike McCarthy does, when Cooper Rush was playing, they were running the ball a lot, and it was leading to wins. They were running the ball and playing defense and not turning the ball over, right? Yeah, when, and you got two studs back there. Yes, Zeke and Pollard. When Dak comes back, there's a tendency from Kellen Moore to abandon the run game and, ask, and fall in love with the passing game of Dak Prescott, and that leads to losses. And that's what happened on, on Sunday. Um, I don't trust Colin Moore. I don't trust Mike McCarthy. And the Cowboys got, got to get back to running the ball. Well, if you didn't notice, that was kind of something that Greg Olson had said. 
He yeah. said that uh, he, he's like, your guys' recipe to win this game is running the ball. You you don't want to have Dak throw the ball 50 times a game. Exactly. You know, and, and by I, did the way, hear that, I did hear that live, and I thought to myself, that's exactly what we've been talking about all season on the podcast. By the way, bro, he is fantastic. Greg Olson? Yes. He's good. I I think he's good, not great. Like, I think he's good. I like Greg Olson. I'm not a big fan of Kevin Burkhart, his his co-host, you know what I mean? His co-commentator. Yeah, yeah Um. and, and Olson also had uh, another point. You know, he's like, you have a pretty decent kicker with a big leg. And secondly, Aaron Rodgers, you know, he didn't call him old. I'm calling him old. You know, you may have a struggling Aaron Rodgers, but you don't want to give him the ball back with good field position. No, you should kick that field goal because you need points, right? Keep the pressure on Green Bay. When you go for it on fourth down there and you don't convert, now all Green Bay needs is a field goal to win. And that's exactly what happened, right? Yeah. Do you think that there's hostility between LaFleur and Rodgers, or was that just the heat of the moment? Um. I think I missed that. What, what, what were they? Uh, oh, they were going back and forth a little bit. Well, I it was because I remember that on that third and one, uh, Lafleur chose to pass the ball, and Rodgers looked at him and was yeah. like, "Run the damn ball!" You know, yeah, and he cussing him uh, out. I, I think that was heat of the moment. That's just them with their backs against the wall. It's desperation mode, trying to win a big game. Uh, I don't think there's a major issue between Rodgers and Lafleur now. I just, okay. You know, that happens in football sometimes. Yeah, absolutely it does. Um, you know, big game from Aaron Jones, 150-plus yards and a touchdown. Big game from safety Rudy Ford, who had two interceptions in that game, and that's already a career high for a season, two picks in a season, and he had two in that game. Yeah, and they were big interceptions too. Yeah. Um. Huge game like we talked about from Christian Watson, three touchdowns. Uh, but, um, I mean, so the Cowboys coming off a loss to the Packers, and now they go to the Vikings. Like I said, I'm worried a little bit about Dallas because they could easily be 6-4, and four, and that's not that good of a record considering the division they're in, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's – I mean, even, even the commanders are bringing up the floor. If the Cowboys lose and the Commanders win, the Cowboys are a half game out of last place in that division. That's crazy to think about. Yeah. Um, and then must win for, for the Packers on Thursday night. Did we pick – who did you pick, Cowboys-Vikings? Did you take Minnesota? Yes, I did. Give me Dallas. Ooh. Yeah, give me the Cowboys over the Vikings. I think. I might change my pick by Sunday, but – that's what my gut's saying right now. Um, I mean, this was a glorified preseason game. The three and six Cardinals at the three and five Rams. Kyler Murray out with a hamstring. So backup Colt McCoy gets the start. And Matthew Stafford out with a concussion. So backup John Wolford gets a start. I mean, I was barely paying attention to this game with two backups out there. You know, it was two bad teams pretty much, right? So, I mean, two bad teams. Uh, the Cardinals get the win, get to four and six. Rams fall to three and six. Let's talk about the state of the Rams, the defending champions. They fall to three and six. Stafford still in concussion protocol. And now star wide receiver Cooper Cup goes on injured reserve with an ankle injury out at least four weeks. I mean, season's over for the Rams, right? Yes. And with Cooper Cup out, I don't blame Stafford for wanting to, to be shut down for the rest of the season. If I'm the Rams, I I don't – that I think that's a good consideration. Why not shut down Stafford, see, you know, put Wolford out there, see if you can, you know, go 4-13 and 13 or 5-12 and 12 and get a high draft pick. Why not, huh? Yep. I mean, I would still stick with Matthew Stafford at quarterback, though. Yeah, but if I'm Stafford and I just had a concussion and and maybe it's a lingering concussion, maybe it's lingering side effects, I'm old, I'm late in my career, 
if I'm Stafford, I don't want to play on a three and six Rams team, man. Sit me down for the rest of the year. We'll talk about next year. Well, yeah, that's that's what I was saying. Is the future is you still got to make it be Matthew Stafford for a couple more years at least. Oh, I mean, ideally, yes. Um, you know, Stafford gives you the best chance to win. He just won in the Super Bowl, so you know. But this year's shot. And if I'm the Rams, I'm going to shut it down. And who would have thought, bro, the defending champion Rams, you know, most people expected them to be in position to potentially repeat, if at, at least make the playoffs. Now it's looking pretty likely they're not even going to make the playoffs. Yeah, that, that's that's crazy. Um, so three and six Rams likely to lose at the three and seven Saints, so. And then big game on Monday Night Football in Mexico City, five and four 49ers at the four and six Cardinals. I expect Kyler Murray to play, but even if Kyler plays, give me the 49ers for the win. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Niners. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, Sunday night, five and three Chargers at the four and four Niners. Chargers top two wide receivers. Mike Williams and Keenan Williams or Keenan Allen both out. Chargers jump out to a 13 to 3 lead in the second quarter, but the Niners rally to win 22 to 16. 49ers safety Hufanga makes the game ending interception his fourth of the season. Bro, a fifth round pick out of USC in 2020 20, or 2021. Hufanga, man, whenever I watch him play, he reminds me of Troy Palomalu. How about you? Yeah, you know, <laughs> it looks almost exactly identical. With that hair and and he's a ball hawk, you know, laying the wood and, and picking off passes. Uh, so the Niners got a special one there. Great value pick, fifth-round pick, and he's a, one of the defensive stars. Yeah, for sure. How about this? DJ linebacker DJ Greenlaw ejected from the game for a hit on Justin Herbert while he's diving for a first down. Bro, this is what I have a hard time understanding. If Herbert was sliding short of the first down and Greenlaw hit him, okay, it's a penalty, even possible ejection. But the fact that Herbert was diving head first, trying to get a first down. What makes him any different from from a running back or wide receiver in that position? Yeah, I I agree. I didn't like the call at all. And, you know, to me, they have to do a lot of work this offseason and clarify what the hell is targeting and, and what is unnecessary roughness. Exactly. And uh, there's nothing wrong with this hit. So now Herbert's diving for a first down. So he's a fucking running back in that situation. You're allowed to hit him. Now, let's address what they call hitting him in the head. So, Herbert's trying to get a first down. All Greenlaw is thinking is trying to stop him from getting the first down. He's not thinking about hitting him in the head. There's no ill intent here at all. And if you watch on replay, Herbert, while diving for the first down, gets hit from a different angle by a different player. So, then the target point is getting moved while Greenlaw is already launched. So he's mid-air going to level the hit. So Greenlaw's target area changes while he's mid-air. So why are we ejecting Greenlaw for something that he cannot control? You know what I mean? In my opinion, that's a football play and nothing we can do about that. Yep, I agree. And, you know, the quarterbacks have to stop putting – if they don't like it, stop putting yourself in harm's way. Bro, the quarterbacks, it's not about not liking it. The quarterbacks are fine with it. If you ask any of these starting quarterbacks, they would tell you, I know the risk. I'm playing football. This is a grown man's sport. In that situation, if I'm Justin Herbert, I'm trying to pick up the first down. I know I'm likely to get hit hard. I don't give a shit because I know I want the first down for my team, you know? Yep, for sure. So the NFL, and my problem is this, the NFL can try to explain it and talk about what is and isn't legal all they want. For a ref in the heat of the moment to throw a flag there, he doesn't know what he's seeing. It's so quick, bang, bang, that they're just throwing a flag. They, The NFL has to make these 
calls reviewable. And it tell me if you agree. If you went back on replay and looked at that play in slow mo, wouldn't you take the flag away? Absolutely. I mean, if college can have the replay, why can't NFL? Exactly. Exactly my point. And the we all have access to replay. We all see replay on all these hits at home. The fans do. And NBC shows it. So why, if NBC can show it, if the fans can see it, if we can all see it and see that it's the wrong call, why can't the officials go on replay and get the call right? That's my question. You know, I agree. And we complained about what? Wanting to review pass interferences and we got it. Yeah, it was for one year, but maybe if we complain enough, we'll be able to get this. Yeah, exactly. They, uh, pass interference should still be reviewable. Josh McDaniel sure would like to go back and be able to review that last call, that last play against Stephon Gilmore. Whether he gets it right or not is a separate issue. The issue is, You'd like to be able to review it, you know. Yep. And uh, and 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 guarantee slow mo replay, double check, make sure we got the call right. That's what we want the opportunity to do. So I've been pushing ever since I started the podcast. This is our fifth year. I've been pushing every year, saying we got to make all this shit reviewable: pass interference, holding, uh, and uh, intentional grounding and uh, targeting make it all reviewable so that we're getting the calls right to the best of our ability and uh, nowadays with legalized gambling shouldn't that be a, you know um a goal right shouldn't that be uh, um you know our our goal to get all the calls right yeah absolutely and i mean especially holding because to me that is the most missed call that yep. happens every game the most. Yep. And if you can go back on replay and see an obvious hold and make the call and, and get the call right, shouldn't that be the goal? Yeah, and it, if they do that, I, I bet you the holding penalties will decrease. Exactly, because they would be getting called for it. And, and on top of that, the offensive holding, I'm assuming, is what you're talking about. Think about how many times a weak defensive holding call is called. I mean, let's go back to the fucking Super Bowl. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I sure would I'm sure Zach Taylor would have liked to challenge that holding call in the Super Bowl, get that call that call overturned and make Stafford have to deal with a fourth and nine. Uh-huh. I'm never gonna let that one go. <laughs> <laughs> um so big win for the Niners uh over the Chargers. Um Good game from Jimmy Garoppolo and Christian McCaffrey. A tough loss for the Chargers, but they got a big opportunity on Sunday night against the Chiefs to get to six and four. If they win and the Chiefs lose, then the Chargers are only one game back of the Chiefs for the division lead. So a massive game on Sunday night. Yeah, yeah, but I ultimately think that the Chiefs are the better team. Give me the Chargers, even though I hate Brandon Staley. I think he sucks. I think Justin Herbert's overrated. Give me the Chargers Ooh. to get a big win. Oh, whoa, oh, oh, whoa, oh. whoa. What did you say? I said Justin Herbert's overrated. I, for one, would like to see Justin Herbert get his team into the playoffs before I crown his ass. Oh, Alex, buddy. That – I have to disagree. Justin Herbert's not overrated. Well, why hasn't he made the playoffs yet? Because of his coach. All right. Well, I mean, you got a point there. But I, I mean, I've seen a lot. Herbert reminds me of Stafford. And you know I don't like Stafford. Herbert has all the arm talent in the world, right? He can make any throw, just like Stafford. My issue is with these guys is sometimes they turn the ball over just a little too much for my life. That's all I got on them. And if Herbert proves me wrong, leads his team to the playoffs, and wins at least one playoff game, if not two, then I'll shut the hell up on on Herbert. But I'm a big prove it guy, and Herbert hasn't proven it to me yet. He's got. No, I mean, there's a big difference to me between talent and potential, and he's proven it to me. You know what I mean? Yeah, and I understand what you're saying, but 
I'm still going off of what he did last year in week 18 at the final game of the season. Dude, to convert that many fourth downs, I've never seen a quarterback do that. Yeah, but did you – everyone likes to bring up those fourth down conversions, but he had multiple mistakes in that game that put them in position to lose. And and did he win the game or did he lose that game? That he was an opportunity him. for Justin Herbert to lead his team for a big road divisional win and get his team into the playoffs. All I'm asking is, did he get the job done? He did not. Oh. But you got to give him credit for looking pretty impressive like that. Man, a lot of quarterbacks in the NFL look impressive. But only a select few go to the conference championship game or the Super Bowl. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's true. That's, to me, the big difference. I like Herbert. I like his skill set. I like his talent. I like his potential. I just want him to prove it to me. And he can start with winning a big game at home against the Chiefs and outdueling Patrick Mahomes and getting a big win. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, it, it, you know, you're over here saying Herbert's not overrated. Well, if Herbert's not overrated, let's go beat Patrick Mahomes in a big game on primetime, all right? All right. <laughs> all right, let's go Monday night. Five and four or four and five commanders at the eight and oh Eagles. This was my call of the weekend. When you saw me pick the commanders to go into Philly on Monday night and end their win end their undefeated season, what did you think when I made that pick? Oh uh, the game started. I didn't believe you at first. Yeah. But you thought Alex was crazy, didn't you? Not crazy. I mean the Commanders ha- have the potential to be spoiler, especially with Heineke at quarterback. Yeah, but it takes balls to make that pick, doesn't it? Absolutely. Yeah, I, I had Eagle fans comment. They were laughing at it. They are like, get out of here. That's not happening. I know Tommy I mean, wanted to make a bet on it. You said what? Tommy wanted to make a bet. But I was oh. like, it's not that serious. Like, e- Philly could easily win this. But my gut is telling me the commanders, you know, it's a division rivalry. It's on Monday night. And nobody goes 17-0, and right? Everyone, even the best teams in football, they trip up eventually. Yeah, and look, I I saw this as it's a divisional game. And the commanders were coming in thinking, like, we need this more than Philly does. Exactly. And also, Philly got exposed a little bit. Yeah. Um, You know, the game wasn't as bad as the score indicates. It was a late, cheap touchdown that made it a double-digit score, 32-21. It was actually a very close and competitive game throughout. Um, But, uh, you know, um, some missed – there was some missed – Some mistakes by the officiating in this game, too. You had that late hit out-of-bounds call on C.J. Gardner-Johnson. That was a bad call. And you had a missed face mask on Eagles tight end Dallas Goddard on that fumble that was a missed call. Uh, Eagle fans had to be upset about those missed calls and understand where we're coming from. Wouldn't it have been nice to review those missed calls and get them right? Absolutely. So that goes to our point, our narrative on that. Um. And then a really stupid penalty on Brandon Ingram or Brandon Graham, the Eagles defensive end. Did you see that when Taylor Henneke late in the game kind of goes down, you know, gives up on the play just to run clock and punt the ball away? And Brandon Graham hits him really late and gets that penalty and an automatic first down. Yeah, you just can't do that. That Because weren't they still in the game at that point? They were. They were about to get the ball back to Jalen Hurts with about a minute to go and a chance to win. Yeah. You can't do that. That's just – That's how you lose your undefeated season with a mental mistake like that. And you're a veteran. Yeah. Grant Graham's going to apologize to the team. He's a veteran. He knows better. Just one of those mistakes that happens. But you can't do that. Yep, absolutely. Big game from Tyler Henneke, though, 200-plus yards. Two turnovers, but he overcomes it. To me, the biggest reason the commanders won 
is they kept converting third downs, and they were running the ball with success. A big game from Brian Robinson, Jr., 86 yards and a touchdown. Um, and then how about Joey Sly, their kicker, going four for four on field goals, including two big kicks, one from 58 and one from 55. That was huge. Yeah, big-ass leg and, uh, you know, came through in the clutch. Um, does uh, Go ahead. Does anything change about your feelings towards Coach Ron Rivera or what? Um, I don't hate Ron Rivera. I don't. Um, he pisses me off at least once a season, if not twice, with some stupid decisions and, and shit like that. But he's a winner. He finds a way to win. He keeps his teams competitive, you know? Yeah. And, is it is it safe to say that maybe Carson is done? Yes. I mean, it's, I'm going to ask you. At this point, isn't it pretty obvious Taylor Henneke is the better quarterback or at least the better fit for the commanders going forward more than Carson Wentz? Absolutely. And I think Wentz was supposed to make his return on Sunday, but uh, Rivera – went ahead and pretty much said that Heineke's going to start. So after yeah, that moment, And we both agree that's the right decision. Yeah. You know, Heineke, uh, Wentz has a higher potential. He always has. But Heineke seems to, you know, just be a winner. And he provides a spark to the offense that Wentz doesn't, you know? Yeah, and, you know, that that's the whole argument we had, you know, sooner with, like, should Dallas keep playing Cooper or, you know, Dak yeah. Prescott? And, and to be fair, Dak is playing better than Wentz. So that's why they went back with Dak. Wentz is struggling. He's struggled since going back to Philly. He struggled in Indy, and he's struggling here in Washington, you know? Yeah, it was that knee injury, man. Yeah, and Wentz might, keyword might, have to, you know, because a team like the Lions, let's say Carson Wentz is available in free agency. Would a team like the Lions jump at him? Honestly, right now, Carson Wentz and Jared Goff are very similar in my opinion. Ooh, I give Goff the slight edge as a better quarterback. Damn, and like, man, because uh, I don't like Goff at all, and I, and Wentz is struggling. So, to me, I don't want either of them. Um, Would you rather take Goff, Wentz, or – the the red rifle in Mr. Uh, Andy Dalton. None. I'll 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 sign a, a quarterback off the street before I'll start any of those guys. Jeez. Give me PJ Walker over all three. <laughs> or Jacoby Brissett. That's uh, bad. Yeah, it's bad. Uh, how about CJ Gardner Johnson, the Eagles' safety? He comes over from the Saints. And he's just been lighting it up. He records a pick in this game. It's his fifth straight game with an interception. And C.J. Gardner-Johnson leads the NFL with six picks so far this year. A career high. Yeah, he's playing very well. Yeah, absolutely balling. Tough news for the Eagles, though. They lose tight end Dallas Goddard for four weeks as he goes on IR with a shoulder injury. That's a big loss. Yep. And, Mike, you know, so that means you don't have to worry about Goddard on Sunday for the Colts uh, against the Eagles. More opportunity for six-round rookie tight end Grant Calcaterra. Do you remember him? I do. Oklahoma and SMU alum. Yes. So we'll see if he can provide, you know, some impact, you know, make some plays for the Eagles. Uh, Eagles at Colts. You're picking Colts, right? Oh, Absolutely. I am too, actually. Um, and then Commanders, good opportunity for the Commanders to get above 500. If they get to 6-5, and five, if they can go into Houston and get a win, we kind of wrote the Commanders off earlier this season. I think he seems to be providing a spark, and maybe he can get them into a playoff conversation in, a, in the tough NFC East. For sure. And uh, let me, you know, for people who think I'm picking the Colts just because they're indie, that's not mm -hmm. true. I have picked against the Colts this season before. So yep. I'm picking the Colts because the fact that it's in Indy. It's in Indy. 
Matt Ryan just coming off a turnover free game, you know. If he can do that again, that's big. And Jeff Saturday seemed to provide a spark, right? Yep, and Jonathan Taylor seems to he looked pretty good against the Raiders. And if if they can keep feeding him and if he gets another hundred yard game, trust me. Stats, uh, stats have shown that the Colts are a very hard football team to beat when Jonathan Taylor goes over 100 yards. Yep, absolutely. So I think the Colts have a shot. I think it'll be a good game, and I'm picking the Colts as well. Uh, for the Eagles, they signed defensive tackle Linval Joseph, the former Viking and Giant. I like that. Yeah, uh, well, with Jordan Davis hurt, they're – Rundy has taken a little bit of a step back, so they add Linval Joseph, and they hope to get Jordan Davis back soon. But if their Rundy's struggling, feed the shit out of Jonathan Taylor, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, all right, bro. Well, good shit as always, man. That was a fun episode, wasn't it? Oh, yeah, for sure it was. Um, Stay tuned, everyone. Don't forget to like, subscribe, leave a comment. We'll keep these episodes coming out every week. Uh, college football episode coming out Thursday. Don't forget to like, subscribe, leave a comment. We appreciate all you guys. Good shit as always, Dustin. Thank you. And peace out.